Hi, my name is Dr. Jason Lee, clinical immunologist and allergist practicing in Toronto, Ontario. The purpose of this website is to train and educate healthcare professionals so that they can understand the concepts necessary to treat patients with immune deficiency. This is not meant to be an exhaustive or comprehensive review, but the main goal is to impart healthcare professionals with the critical and practical knowledge needed. Without further ado, let's get started. The immune system exists to recognize and control encounters with microbes. Not all microbes are harmful to us, and our body needs a way to figure out which things are harmful and which things can be left alone. Broadly speaking, there are bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and helminths that can be potentially pathogenic to us. They can damage healthy tissues, damage organs, and damage fetal development. The first critical concept to understand is the difference between innate and adaptive immune system. Now, one thing I want you to keep in the back of your mind is that these entities, or our separate arms of the immune system, do not actually operate in isolation, but talk to one another all the time. However, for conceptually learning this, let's separate them out. The immune system has this innate arm. You can think of this as hardwired or intrinsic responses that are encoded into our DNA. Some of these things can recognize common microbial structures that are members of many groups of pathogens. The innate immune system you can think of as the first line defenders. Once something has invaded our bodies, whether it be through the skin, mucosal tissues in the gut, lungs, nose, the first guys that interact and recruit other cells into the area to help fight are part of the innate immune system. Later on, once the innate immune system has tried to fight the infection, it will recruit other guys, the more fine-tuned defenders of the immune system. We call these the adaptive cells of the immune system, or adaptive immune system in short. The adaptive immune system is able to rearrange gene segments somatically to generate antigen binding molecules. This allows us for a much more customized and robust response. To put it another way, the innate immunity includes physical barriers such as epithelial cells, your skin, mucosal membranes. It also includes complement proteins, defensins, collectins, toll-like receptors found in various cells, phagocytic cells, including most antigen-presenting cells, and natural killer cells. The innate immunity acts within immediate exposure and continues to be part of the process in clearing the infection. The adaptive immunity often takes a day or more to kick in. This includes T cells, effector T cells, B cells, which turn into plasma cells, antibodies, and other components of the complement system. So, in order for the immune system to protect us, the critical factor is really distinguishing what is harmful from not harmful. For the innate immune system, there's something called target recognition or recognition of self from non-self using built-in systems. This often involves something called pathogen-associated molecular patterns called PAMPS, P-A-M-P-S to be short. Some of these things act as a bridge between innate and adaptive immune system. For the adaptive immune system, the target recognition often occurs through something called antibodies or immunoglobulins that are produced by B cells or through T cell receptors that recognize and are able to react to all sorts of antigens. The term antigen is defined as something that your body can react to. To be technical, all antigens need to be presented in the context of major histocompatibility complex. Now let's talk about how white blood cells are formed. Every single white blood cell is formed from something called the hematopoietic stem cell that exists in bone marrow. The stem cell move into one of two different broad categories of progenitor cells called the common lymphoid progenitor cell or the myeloid stem cell. If it goes through the lymphoid progenitor lineage, it can produce B cells, NK cells, NKT cells, and other T cells. The myeloid stem cell produces various colony forming units, whether it be the GM variant, eosinophil variant, basophil variant, mast cell variant, megalokaryocyte variant, or erythrocyte variant. The erythrocyte lineage produces red blood cells. The megalokaryocytes produce megalokaryocytes. Mast cell produces mast cells, basophils, basophils, and eosinophils, eosinophils. The GM, which is produced by granulocyte macrophage colony 
each stimulating factor, produces monocytes and neutrophils. These can further differentiate into dendritic cells and macrophages if they come out of the monocyte lineage. Now that we know the lay of the land, let's talk more about the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system has two components. Again, this is a simplification because there are actually more than two components, but let's conceptualize this by splitting things into broad categories. T cells and B cells. B cells are responsible really for the humoral immunity that occurs. The humoral immunity that occurs does so by using something called antibodies. Antibodies are sort of like the bullets of the immune system. They go out and take care of pathogens. They do this by a number of mechanisms depending on the effector function that it elicits. When we look at an antibody, we see that we can compartmentalize different arms of it. On the top half, there are two arms called the FAB fragments. Within these contain three domains called the complementary determining regions. These domains will determine the affinity of the antibody toward whatever antigen it is reacting to. The FC component will bind to B cells membranes and actually act as a receptor for different antigens. If a cell is stimulated by binding an antigen, this will induce signal cascade down below into the B cell to produce various effector functions, including but not limited to producing more antibodies. The CDR regions, of which there are three, undergo various changes that we will get to in the next lecture. There are five types of antibodies in the body. To be tactical, I should say five classes. All antibodies start out as the IgM variant. Once a B cell is stimulated, it converts into a plasma cell. In so doing, depending on the signals that it gets from T cells called cytokines or the cytokine milieu, it will produce different antibodies depending on what function is primarily needed. An IgM antibody is the starting point for all classes of antibodies. It will class switch into an IgA if antibodies are primarily needed in mucosal membranes, an IgG, an all-purpose general refined antibody, an IgE to deal with parasitic infections, and an IgD which may regulate the immune system. The T cell has a similar receptor called the T cell receptor, which incidentally was discovered in Toronto. The T cell also has contact sites for ligands or antigens. This occurs in the V beta and alpha segments, which are the top half of the T cell receptor. Similarly to an antibody, it also has a constant domain called the C alpha and C beta. Once a T cell receptor engages something from an antigen presenting cell from the innate immunity, it will cascade and form a response. The response depends on which antigen it's dealing with and how best it thinks it can deal with it. The T cell receptor is too small and doesn't have the intracellular machinery attached. As such, it requires subsequent co-receptors and we call these the CD3 complex. This consists of epsilon, delta, gamma, and epsilon subgroups. Attached to the epsilon, delta, gamma, and epsilon subgroups are something called ITAMs, I-T-A-M-S. This refers to immunoreceptor tyrosine kinase activating molecules. These undergo phosphorylation and induce downstream changes. In the skid lecture, we will talk about how this can play a role. Pathogens that take up resonance inside cells need to be presented. This occurs through the MHC class 1, which includes all cells with a nucleus. If it's outside the cell, it may need to be taken up by antigen-presenting cells, such as phagocytic cells. T cells recognize infected cells by binding to the combined structure that includes a self-membrane protein and part of the pathogen. We talked about the major compatibility complex. This is often referred to as HLA or human lymphocyte antigen in humans. T cells are MHC restricted. MHC class 1 is restricted to largely the CD8 cells and MHC class 2 is restricted to CD4 cells. A T cell comes out of the bone marrow as a naive CD4 negative, CD8 negative, and T cell receptor negative cell. This then undergoes training in the thymus to become either a CD4 positive or CD8 positive cell. This is a good point to break and I will continue this lecture in the next part.